today. Uh, while it's wet outside and uh, changing our clocks and all that last night, but we appreciate you being here early to worship the Lord today. We begin our service with another great musician that's part of our musical family here, Connie Money and Jack, her husband, play in our orchestra and sing in the choir. And let's welcome Connie as she plays on the piano this morning. Calvary covers it all in the old rugged cross. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank Connie and all our great musicians that continue to provide such beautiful music for us week and week out. Today we reflect on 1 Timothy that leads us into our first song, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. But I received mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory for the only God ever and ever. Amen. Give him glory. Let's stand together as we sing. Immortal, invisible, God only one.
the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and have eternal life. Great Father of He has proven that again and again in my life and your life, I hope. Can you say that he has been almighty and victorious, the ancient of days? There's so many stories in the Bible that reflect on that. One is the story of Jehoshaphat, who was facing the enemy, battles from all directions that were coming towards him. And he could have called on his armies, couldn't he? Remember that in 2 Chronicles, where he could have called out to his armies to fight. But what did he do? He bowed on his knees. And he asked the Lord to be with him and to worship him. He worshiped him instead of worshiping idols like other kings had done. He worshiped the Lord God Almighty. He said, God, this is your battle, not my battle. So this song we're gonna to learn today, it's a new song for this congregation. It's called The Battle Belongs. So let's sing it together and reflect on that. Oh, 
fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. No, no mighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows.
Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Uh, my name is Sydney, and I serve in the missions office here at Brainerd. And we just have a few announcements we want to bring your attention to um, before we carry on in worship this morning. Uh, so starting this Wednesday, Bill Stiles and uh, Tara Waldrop will be leading a six-week course on faith and work that's going to be taking place up in the BX. So if you're interested in um, taking the class, it's going to be six weeks. It'll start this Wednesday. I believe that's 6.15 to 7.30. Um, and they'll be discussing, walking through what the word says about work, about finances, and about calling. So you can go online and register for that. The class is free, but please go on and register so that teachers can prepare accordingly. And then secondly is our Women's Spring Garden Party. That's coming up on March 30th. That's our women's, it's an annual event for our women where we get together, we gather, we uh, fellowship, we eat good food, and we just spend time together in God's word and hearing from other ladies in our church as to what God is doing in their life. So if you have not registered for that, I encourage you to go online and do so. We still need a few ladies to um, host a table. So uh, maybe if you um, have a life group or you have some ladies at work or friends or family that you would like to invite, I encourage you to go online and register. You can find more information online. And then lastly is our Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We're about one month out from Easter Sunday. Um, and so we will commemorate, that'll be Easter Sunday, I believe, falls on April 9th this year. On April 7th, we will have two Good Friday services. One will be here in the sanctuary. I think that's at 12 p.m. And then one at the North Georgia campus, I believe, at 6.30. And then on Sunday, we're going to have three Easter services. There will not be life group hour. Um, so anyways, just go ahead and mark that on your calendar and get that in your brain. And uh, just go online and find more information for all that's going on here at Brainerd. If you'll bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to see a mission moment video. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we just bow before you, and uh, we just praise you for your love, the deep, deep love of Jesus, um, that you would send him for us to, to reconcile us back to you, God. Um, I pray this morning as we hear your word, as we watch these mission moment videos, would you just deepen our awe and our wonder for who you are, um, your love for us, and our worship. God, would you be pleased and honored with our time of worship this morning? Would you bless our time of life group hour and the second service, God, and all that's going on in the other ministries and the kids' ministry around the church and student ministry? Uh, God, we love you. We want to know you more. Um, so help us. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It is so good to see you. I we all probably got in our cars and it was dark and cold and wet and really, really early. But we're here and good news, we get to open God's word together. So if you have your Bibles, could you take them and turn to John chapter 15? John chapter 15, I missed you last week. It is good to be back this week. Can I pray for us that the Lord would give us ears to hear what he has to say to us today? Let me pray. Our Father, we confess that our minds can really wander and our hearts can be really stubborn and our good intentions can break down really quickly. But you can change all that. We've sung about your power to do the impossible. So I pray that you would focus our minds and our hearts on what you're saying. Would you break down any unbelief any cynicism we have as we approach your word. And please help us not just to hear, but to live by every word that comes out of your mouth. And we ask for this help through the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder how much of our time, I wonder how much of your life is spent managing expectations. Managing expectations. So when I've officiated weddings, it Jesus is wanting to give you solace and comfort for those reasons. I think what he would call on all of us to do when we act inappropriately, when we are rude and unkind, is to repent and ask for forgiveness and ask for Jesus to produce in us the fruit of the Spirit. Having said that, though, 
A lot of times when we're hated as a Christian, much of it just seems really irrational. Like there's no logic to it. How did I end up on the wrong side? Maybe, maybe you, you look and you honestly evaluate things and say, I haven't been a jerk. I, I really don't know why this person seems just opposed to me out to undermine everything, talking behind my back, gossiping, the campaign that seems to just really discredit you. I don't understand why a relative just has such an anger against me. I don't understand why my beliefs, my following Jesus, Jesus is telling us this is why. This is why you are tied to him. And even Jesus himself says in the book of John, he came to this world and people rejected him. And he says, they hated me. They wanted darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We can expect life in this world to be hard because we're part of a bigger story. We can expect it too. According to Jesus in verse 19, we're just not of the world, but we have been, the word Jesus says, is chosen out of it. We have been, by God's own choice, brought out of the world. So if we were a part of the world, if we were of the world, the world would love us. But Jesus says we've been chosen out of it. I read this from one of the, my, my favorite writers on the book of John, and he summarizes it so clearly. It apparently deeply irritates the world that disciples, disciples in it, go against many of its major convictions and seem sorely out of step with many of its major passions. We're not of the world. We're not a part of it. Well, yeah, I mean, there's going to be lots of life that overlaps with every other human being on the planet. We get that. There are going to be lots of overlap with the, our, our neighbors and who we're in the office with and where we shop for groceries and where we work out. And there's going to be lots of overlap in all kinds of people in Chattanooga and all kinds of people in this world with our free time and our, our habits. But, but there's going to be differences as well. It's going to be things that the world says, that's totally fine. And we go, I cannot excuse that because I follow Jesus. And all of a sudden it parts. We're not of the world. Our convictions, our pursuits, our ambitions. I think of all the kids that are going to get dropped off in Brainerd Kids this morning. And I think of all the parents and grandparents and foster parents and aunts and uncles and all those that are invested in the lives of those kids. And there's something different that we know for our kids of course, there's a lot of overlap in what every human wants, the hopes and dreams they have for their kids. But there are differences. Let me just say to all the parents, your primary goal is not that your kid fits in this world. And it's hard. It's hard to watch when your kid doesn't fit in, when they're mocked, when they don't look like everybody else in the world. It's hard to watch that. But Jesus intervened. And he pulled us out of the world to where we say things like, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Jesus Christ made us his own, but he tells us like, that is going to mean you're not of the world and the world hates you. I think of what that means for our persecuted brothers and sisters all over the world. You pick up another reason in the second part of verse 21. So as you're reading verse 21, kind of the second half of it says, there's this issue of they don't know who the one who sent me. In verse 22, Jesus says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. I don't, I know from the rest of scripture, he's not saying they were totally innocent until he came. No, no, obviously people were doing wrong things before Jesus came. But there is an added guilt when God in the flesh comes to this earth and people ignore him and have no time for him. It says, the one who hates me also hates my father. In verse 23, if I had not done the works among them that no one else had done, maybe that guilt wouldn't be so pronounced. They would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. Jesus exposes guilty ignorance, and there's no excuse we're exposed. We never were innocent in the first place. There's something about God coming in the flesh that shows our hearts. This is what John 3, 36 says. It says, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not have life. The wrath of God remains on him. 
I don't mean to be flippant. But here is what this is saying. When Jesus came, and that was the crucial event of the whole universe of all time, but we found other things to occupy our time. Jesus came into the world, but there's, but there's a TikTok video and there's a YouTube thing that I want to watch. And that seems much more interesting than God coming in flesh. Jesus came, but, oh yeah, that's right, you've got that career advancement that you're really pursuing. You got that vacation to plan. And that seems far more consuming of your life and your time. Jesus came. And yet, you're so busy trying, I'm so busy trying to control all these aspects of my life and make sure I bend this world to my will. I'm so self-absorbed that I didn't realize he's the Lord. He calls all the shots. You, you see the greater guilt here, it's exposed. And I wonder if that draws you to turn or does it just cause you to say, I really don't have time for you, Jesus because I've got a lot of things going on in this world right now. Jesus is managing ex Walk away because things got hard and because this world didn't seem to you know, give you the thumbs up on every single thing. I, I want you to be prepared. I don't want you to deconvert. I don't want you to walk away. I want you to hang in there. I want you to know what you can expect. And he's not just saying it even to one disciple, but a group of disciples. He's saying it to a community of believers like ours. I'm telling you these things. The world, it may get hard. It may get difficult. And I'm telling you this so that you as a community, us as believers, would, we would hold together. We'd partner together. We wouldn't freak out. We wouldn't forget. And I say that knowing it may be very hard for you right now. I... I get burdened because I know Sunday can be such a highlight and we're with brothers and sisters and you walk into a life group and people love you and know your name and they care for you. But some of you, you will walk into the exact opposite tomorrow. You got a coworker, a neighbor, or you got a, maybe even a family member who like, you wish you shared the greatest thing in common with, but you don't. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a kid just really doesn't understand why you do what you do. And it's not just that they don't understand. They just really, really don't care for you. And that's made your life very, very difficult. Jesus helps us, helps us with these expectations. Life will be hard. But I love in the middle of this, we just get these pointers to Jesus. Yeah, life will be hard. The world will hate you but we have someone who keeps pointing us to Jesus in verse 26, a counselor who keeps just testifying of him. Look at verse 26 of John 15. We skipped these verses a minute ago when I read. I want to come back to him because Jesus says, when the counselor comes and he's the one I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness. It's a court, courtroom word. He will testify about me and you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. You will also testify. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, when the world hates you, hate the world right back. When the world gives it to you, give it to them right back. When the world hates you, write them off and walk away. He doesn't say that. But there's this idea of we are even going to give testimony. We're even going to testify. We're going to bear witness to the hope of the world is Jesus. So we can expect that as a follower of Jesus, not only will it be hard, but I think what the promise here in John 15 and even in John 16, we can also expect that we have an active helper. You can expect as a follower of Jesus, you have an active helper. What good news is that? So it's not as if you're presented as a situation, some of you know, like an escape room where you, you get in this room and you've got to try to find clues and work together to try to get out of the room, which is a fun game to play, but not if it's life where you feel like you're stuck. And what if Jesus said, I'm going to give you a few clues and maybe you'll get through this world to get together somehow. 
But that's not what he said. He said, I have called someone alongside you. You have an active helper managing our expectations. Here's what you can expect. You can't expect for the world to be really hard. And you can't expect that you have an active helper if you're my disciple. Look what he says in verse 7 of John 16. So this is John 16 and verse 7. I mean, Jesus doesn't have to qualify anything, but he does, I think, because our hearts don't, maybe we don't believe it. He says, nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. Well, of course he is. He's Jesus. He only speaks the truth. But we need to be, we need to be reminded maybe one more time. He's telling us the truth. We can take this to the bank. We can count on this. I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, the counselor would not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There's active help. There's an active counselor. There's an active advocate for us. We can't chase every single... I mean, I've read these verses before, but I'm reminded of them again, how good it is. I think of the Holy Spirit and three words that just keep coming back again and again. The Spirit is personal. The Spirit is better. And the Spirit brings something new, personal, better, and new. Personal in the sense that I just noticed that this week, whenever Jesus talks about sending sending the Spirit, he doesn't just say he's going to send this impersonal force into the world. He says, I'm sending the Spirit to you, to you. He is coming, not just in general to this planet, but he's coming to you, to you individually. You will know the Spirit, how personal the Holy Spirit is, not this impersonal force. And Jesus goes out of his way to say, it's going to be better for you when the Spirit comes. How can it be better than having Jesus in the flesh? He comes to us. Jesus dies and goes to be with the Father, but... Jesus wasn't permanently with all of his disciples in the flesh, and he says, spirit will be with you. Geography, it won't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're in Palestine. It doesn't matter whether you're in North America, Southeast Asia. The spirit will be present with you. You're not going to need a single human being in the flesh, but now all of us. There's something personal. There's something better. And then I just love how the the anticipation is building. Like when the Spirit comes, it's going to be a new era, a new era. And we don't have time to look at each one of these verses. I did at least want to give them to you. So maybe you can jot a few of them down and read them throughout the week of what it means to be in this new era of the Holy Spirit having come. Can I just highlight a few of the things in Isaiah 44 that says, this is the word of the Lord, your maker, the one who formed you from the womb. He will help you. And he says, I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and blessing on your offspring. Or how about the one in Ezekiel 36 there, where Jesus, or where Ezekiel speaks for the Lord and the Lord says, I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols and There's a time coming where I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes. Or how about that one in Joel, Joel 2. It says, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. I'll pour out my spirit even on the male and female slaves in those days and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Did you take it all in? I don't think you could. I don't think we could take it all in, what it means to have this new era where even Moses and Abraham and David and all those in the old covenant did not experience like we experienced us, us who walked into this room today as followers of Jesus have a new assurance, experience a new cleansing, have our hearts like sensitive in a new way. There's new obedience, new motivation for obedience. There's new ministry that we've been given to share the word with each other, new fruitfulness that will come out of that. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. I I, I couldn't have earned that, but here is the gift of the Spirit. So when I say that one thing you can expect is to have this active helper. 
I don't know how you process all of, you know, all the teaching of the Holy Spirit, but I want you to realize what a promise this is. We are told that the Holy Spirit goes to work on the world. I mean, he doesn't write off the world, but convicts it. About sin, because they don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you'll no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So much we could say there. He says that he will... Holy Spirit's going to convict the world of sin. And what is, the, what is the clear example of sin? It's unbelief. The world doesn't believe, shrugs its shoulders. Why the big deal about Jesus? And the Holy Spirit goes to work on the world. He convicts the world of righteousness. Jesus says, righteousness because I'm going to the Father. Most people have an idea of what makes them righteous, makes them right makes them okay, makes them better than most, better than some. And the world gets it wrong. And the Holy Spirit shines the spotlight on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and says, look at him. Look at him who was faithful in every battle against sin. Look at him who always loved his neighbor. Look at him who died who bled out, who was executed as a pleasing offering for our sin. Look at this one who rose from the dead with all authority. Look at this one who's going to the Father and sits at his right hand. That's the measuring standard. This is righteousness, the one who goes to the Father. And the Spirit convicts of judgment. The world gets it wrong about sin. The world gets it wrong about righteousness. And the world gets it wrong about judgment, pretending like maybe the judgment will never come. Or maybe if judgment comes, it'll be more like a, an irritating parking fine to, that, you know, I got to give a couple bucks that I really would rather not, but no big deal, no harm, no foul. And the world gets it totally wrong. Of like, the prince of this world is judged. And all those who are living in the domain of darkness, they're headed for judgment. If our eyes are open. And maybe your eyes are being opened. Like you hear these words of Jesus and maybe they're coming alive to you in a way that they have never come alive to you before. Maybe you're saying, like, I thought Christianity was mainly just trying to be a good person with a little bit of Jesus in our lives. But maybe you're realizing now, you know, the way Jesus talked, everything rides on him. And maybe you... Maybe faith is coming alive. Maybe it's never meant that much to you. But here you are, and you can't explain it, but why his words here seem so compelling. Well, what will you do with that? What should you do? Well, you certainly could talk with someone that you know loves Jesus. You certainly could talk with maybe the person that invited you, that brought you. You could certainly talk with one of the pastors after church. I mean, there will be some in the back, some in the front here. But how long is it worth waiting to get this settled? Is this something that you say, I'll handle that in a few weeks when I've got time to think about it? No, today's the day you think about it. Today's the day you open up your heart and say, Jesus, I I don't have it all figured out, but I'm, I'm trusting in you. I will rely on you. Maybe the Holy Spirit has convicted you. One of the ministries of the Spirit is a... But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. Just like circle that word all in your mind. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because He will take from what is mine and declare it to you Everything in verse 15, everything the Father has is mine. And this is why I told you that he will take from what is mine and will declare it to you. These are amazing promises. The Holy Spirit will guide those disciples into all the truth. I think there's lots of uh, implications of that promise. I think first and foremost, the disciples here are getting comprehensive insight from the Spirit, all these words like speaking and declaring and announcing and bearing witness, I mean, telling through the work of the Holy Spirit, this is what we have. We have God's words. We have the words of Jesus. Jesus says, I can't tell you everything while I'm here. 
But the Spirit is going to guide Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Jude. He's going to guide them into all the truth and the things that Jesus did not even cover. It's going to be fleshed out as we have God's Word. What an amazing privilege comes straight from the Father, straight from Jesus, and we receive what God wants us to have. So we ask the question, like, how am I supposed to live my life? How am I supposed to grow? How am I supposed to be? I mean, Scripture speaks a lot of maturity. How am I going to get there? And Jesus says, I've spoken to you, but the Spirit's guiding my disciples, and they're going to be guided into all truth, and you're going to have exactly what you need. How should the community of Jesus, Joel, that I referred to earlier, we not only have God's word, but he said everybody is going to be able to speak it to each other. So you're not going to need a seminary degree hanging on your wall. You're not going to need an advanced certificate to be able to use God's word and communicate it to another believer. There's not going to be a rank of like kind of the JV Christian that probably shouldn't speak God's word to another Christian. Everybody is free. Every man, every woman. I mean, we could say every child who has Jesus Christ in them has been given the spirit and we've been given this, given God's word to speak it to each other, to build each other up. And through it all, the spirit is just pouring out glory on Jesus. I have enjoyed being back at Brainerd. And I'll tell you this week, Tuesday and Wednesday, if I took you through a couple aspects of my day, one of our staff meetings, Tuesday we opened with Psalm 46 and we just read it. And we heard the words of the Spirit come alive and cement those in our heart. Be still and know that I am God. Wednesday evening, take you to multiple places, one where Colossians is open, one where Hebrews is open, one where Habakkuk is open, and the Spirit is speaking. It made my day to see a couple of our college ministry leaders getting ready to walk through First Peter with a couple college students. It made my day to see two ladies, very different seasons of life, meeting in the BX, and, and this is what... This is what was happening. God's word was open and they were talking to each other. We have an active helper who like, takes these words and animates them and brings those to life. Some of you made it a priority. I mean, maybe you really didn't have a ton of time, but the time you did have, you made it a priority. To be in God's word, to listen to it. So what, what do we take away? I mean, Jesus gave us some things we can expect. So you can expect the world to be hard, but, but actually what he doesn't say is, our, our world would say, you know, when it gets tough, you just look inside and draw strength inside. He doesn't tell you to do that. He actually says to look outside yourself. He says the Holy Spirit's coming alongside you. And to look to the words of Jesus, the Spirit, our true helper, is going to point us to him, and we're going to turn to him again and again. And even when our faith is weak, we're going to put ourselves in relationships to hear God's word spoken to us. And Jesus gives us great, great confidence. I've spoken these things to you. So you won't walk away. He's keeping us through his word, through the work of the spirit. Can we thank him for that? Let's pray. This morning, our Father, we have sung that you are immortal and even though you are invisible, your wisdom is directing things. We've reminded ourselves, Father, that uh, the battle does belong to you. We've reminded ourselves of the deep love your son has for us. And we've needed those reminders because we enter a world that's complicated and hard and I may not even have even the beginning of an idea of what a difficult week some of my brothers and sisters in here may face. But you know, and you are giving us strength, you are giving us active help because we have an active helper. So I pray that you would give us eyes to see that. Lord, that you, amen.
I invite you to stand. Let's sing. for being here this morning. We're also thankful for the word that we just heard. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit that brings conviction in heart. I know my heart has been convicted this morning. I can say I, I basically have been brought down to size. Uh, the, the, that's what the Holy Spirit has done in my heart, and I pray he's done it in your heart as well. Brother Curtis, said, get it settled before you leave here today. We would love to see that and, and welcome you into the family of God. We say this every Sunday, and, and I pray that this is not something that that we, we just do out of rote memory, that you, you're saying, well, here we go, Psalm 67, 1 and 2 again. But I ask you to listen carefully to what these words have to say from God's Word, and let it, let it guide us, let it be our strength for this week as we go. Psalm 67, 1 and 2, and like I said, you can probably quote it by memory, but let me just share it with you as we're dismissed today. May God be gracious to, uh, to you and bless you. May he make his face shine upon you so that his way may be known on the earth, his salvation among the nations. Thank you again for being here. God bless you. As you go to life groups, may God's word continue to speak to you there as well. Thank you.